Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Our call to worship can be found in the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 16, verses 28 to 35. Ascribe to the Lord or families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, The Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exalt and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for He comes to judge the earth. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. And save us, O oh God of our salvation, and gather and deliver us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Let's pray. Lord God, teach us your way, O oh Lord, and lead us on a level path. Teach us, O oh Lord, to follow your decrees, then we will keep them to the end. Give us understanding, and we will keep your law, and obey it with all our hearts. Lord Jesus, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the Christ, the Son, and the living God. Help us now to hear, believe, and obey what you say to us today. And in this we pray in most holy precious name. Amen. we'd like to share with you today. First one is that we're excited to announce a new life group and discipleship class. This is a series of guided discipleship sessions along with fellowship and support from 
fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Classes are bi-weekly held on Wednesday, 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Space is limited, so if you are interested in joining, please email lifegroups at cecctoronto.com. Second announcement is that due to the current public health situation because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have postponed our annual congregational meeting until further notice. We have applied for and received authorization for this postponement from the federal government. To keep the congregation up to date on church activities and initiatives, we, have, we will be having our town hall meeting today at 2 p.m. We'll provide a brief financial and ministry update as well as the framework for reopening the church building. Visit cecctoronto.com for more information. Our scripture passage for today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 1 to 15. I'll be reading from the NIV version. It reads, At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send your men to Joppa and bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then the voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have not eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. God bless the reading of his word. As a follower of Christ, as God's people, how should we see people and treat people of other ethnic backgrounds who speak a different language from us? Are we quick to have prejudice or discrimination towards others? Or do we show them the love of Christ? I want to wrestle with these questions in light of the sad current events going on. The racial violence happening to our black brothers and sisters, neighbors, and centuries of racism that they've experienced. How should we be living and thinking as Christians? What does the Bible have to say? Let's look into our own hearts. Do we see our own culture, our own ethnic group as superior to others? Do we look down on others? Does God prefer one ethnic group over another? What does the Bible say? The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this morning, to tackle these questions, I want to look with you at the Word of God in Acts 10. I want to look with you today at the story of Simon Peter, who's a Jew, and Cornelius, who's a Gentile Roman centurion. God called Peter to bring the gospel good news about Jesus to Cornelius and his family. But before Peter goes on this mission trip, God had to change his heart. God had to transform his heart, to open his heart regarding his view, his opinion, his perception of people of other ethnicities. Dear brothers and sisters, let's look in our, at our hearts today. Does God need to transform our hearts today? Are we quick to have prejudice about others? 
or are we quick to love others? Acts chapter 10 seems to be the first time that Peter intentionally goes out to reach a non-Jewish person with the gospel. But remember Jesus' great commission to his disciples before he ascended to heaven. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. And in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. That's not easy. And then to the ends of the earth, to all the Gentile nations. And we see from Acts chapter 1 to chapter 7, the disciples have been active in preaching the gospel to their own people. But in Acts chapter 8, we have the first of the disciples, Philip, finally going to Samaria. And it was also Philip who was the one who was led by the Holy Spirit to share the gospel to the Ethiopian official. Now in Acts chapter 10, God is calling Peter to the next stage, to the next frontier of missions. It's time for the disciples to go to the ends of the earth. Peter's first Gentile mission is to Caesarea. This was about 65 miles northwest of Jerusalem, of their hometown. And Caesarea is the capital of the Roman government in Judea. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. He was a Roman centurion. A centurion is like a captain today. He's in charge of about 100 soldiers. And he's part of the Italian cohort. But the Bible says something unique and special about this Roman centurion. Verse 2 says that he is a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Cornelian, Cornelius is what is known as a God-fear. What is a God-fear? A God-fear is a Gentile and not a Jew. But he abandoned the worship of the pagan gods of the Greco-Roman world. And they choose monotheism. They choose to worship the God of Israel. The Bible says he's a devout man. He feared God with all of his household. There's two things that we learn about him regarding his faith in practice. First, he was generous. He gave alms to the people, to the poor. And second, he prayed continually to God. He may not follow all the Jewish religious traditions, but these two things was known about him that he was generous in giving alms, and he prayed continually to God. One day, while he was praying during the ninth hour, around three o'clock in the afternoon, a set time for Jewish prayers, God gave him a vision. In the vision, he saw an angel of God. And the angel said this, Cornelius, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Cornelius, God sees your prayers and your alms. God sees your devotion and the good deeds that you do for other people. Do you sometimes wonder if your prayers are being heard? Brothers and sisters, do you sometimes wonder if the good you do in the name of Christ is of any worth? Even if others do not see, take heart, for God sees. Your prayers and your alms, Cornelius, have ascended as a memorial before God. And then the angel said to Cornelius in verse 5, Now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. Afterwards, when the angel left, Cornelius immediately called in two of his servants and one of his devout soldiers. And he related everything to them, the vision that he saw, and he immediately sent them to Joppa. It's interesting, the soldier that Cornelius sent to fetch Peter was also described as a devout believer. He was also a God-fear. And now let's go to the next scene. Peter is in Joppa. Peter is staying in the house of a disciple named Simon the Tanner. At around 12 noon, Peter himself went to the roof of the house to pray. 
While he was praying, he became hungry. It was around lunchtime, and he wanted something to eat. But before the people in the house, uh, the people in the house were still preparing the food, Peter fell into a trance, and he also saw a vision. What did he see? He saw the heavens opened, and something like a great sheet coming down by, you know, four corners to earth. What was in the sheet? He saw all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And then a voice came saying to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The Old Testament has strict dietary laws for Israel. They were not allowed to eat certain animals like pork, Leviticus chapter 11, because they were considered unclean. And the voice came to him a second time, and it said, it said this, What God has made clean, do not call common. What God has made clean, do not call common or unclean. This event, this vision happened three times. Now, Peter was confused. He was bewildered. He was puzzled. He was perplexed because he was trying to figure out the meaning of this dream. And as he was trying to figure out the, the, the meaning, interestingly, great timing, it's not a coincidence, but ordained by God, the men who were sent by Cornelius happened to be standing at the gate of Simon's house. They finally arrive at uh, Joppa. And they're asking, is there a certain Simon Peter that is living in this place, staying here? The Holy Spirit said to Peter at that time, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I've sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And the men replied, We've come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. Now I have to stop here for a moment because what's happening right now is significant. The fact that Peter permitted the two Gentile servants and the one devout soldier to lodge with him in the same house is an indication that the wall in his heart was beginning to come down. The divide between Jew and Gentile in his heart was beginning to come down. Dear brothers and sisters, is there a wall in our hearts hindering us from reaching out and loving others? We have to remember something. Peter is staying in Joppa. Joppa. If you remember one of our guest speakers, Dr. Robert Cousins, when he came to speak to us, he said Joppa is an interesting place. Joppa is also mentioned in the Old Testament. Do you remember where in the Old Testament Joppa is mentioned? If you know, you can tell your family members. Joppa is the place where Jonah ran away to, to find a ship to Tarshish, to run away from God. Why? Because he did not want to go to Nineveh. God called him to go to Nineveh. It would not be a stretch to say that Jonah disliked, even hated the people of Nineveh. The two nations were at war with each other. The people of Nineveh were a wicked people. Nineveh was a capital of the Assyrian Empire, the number one enemy of Israel at that time. And God wanted to send Jonah to them to call them to repentance. And Jonah wanted to run away from God. And you know, when the Ninevites listened to Jonah's message and repented, God did not destroy Nineveh. And Jonah became even angrier. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, it says this, He, Jonah, prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is, why, that, uh, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah knew the kind of God Yahweh was. 
He was a God of compassion and of grace and who relents from sending calamity. He was slow to anger. That's why Jonah ran away from God. Because Jonah wanted God to punish his enemies. He, he was angry at his enemies. Well, let's go back to Peter. Several hundred years later, he's also in Joppa. And the Holy Spirit commanded Peter, just like God commanded Jonah, to go to the Gentiles. And we have to understand there is this history of conflict between the Jews and the non-Jews, the Gentiles. It was the Gentiles, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Romans, the Greco-Roman, who conquered them, who colonized them. There was racial prejudice between the groups, distrust, there was bitterness, there was hatred. Jewish tradition considered Gentiles to be unclean. It was considered unclean to associate with Gentiles because the Gentiles were predominantly idol worshippers. But what did Peter do when the Holy Spirit told them to go with them? Unlike Jonah, Peter obeyed. He obeyed the Holy Spirit. But before Peter was willing to go with them, God had to transform Peter's heart. God had to transform Peter's heart. Dear brothers and sisters, God does God need to transform our hearts? to show us his love for other ethnic groups also. When, we, when you and I look at people of other nationality who speak a different language from us, are we quick to have prejudice towards them or to see them as people that God loves also, that he wants to bring back to him? Dear brothers and sisters, do you and I have love for people of other nations? and other ethnic groups to bring the gospel to them? Do we have, or do we have racism or prejudice in our hearts? That's a question that we need to ask ourselves today. But did you know that there is also reverse racism? When we have prejudice or bitterness towards our own native culture. And that is prejudice too, that's discrimination too. The Apostle Paul was a missionary to the Gentiles. That's what God called him too. But his heart also went out to his own people. He loved his own people too. He said in Romans chapter 9, verse 3, Paul says, For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, so that they can be engrafted into the vine, engrafted into God's people. His heart went out to the Gentiles, but his heart also went out to his own people. Dear brothers and sisters, what about you? Do you have a heart for the nations? But do you have a heart for your own people also? Do we love other people? Do we have a love for our own people too? Now, as we go back to our story, we're going to realize that Joppa to Caesarea is about 50 kilometers. It's about two days travel. So Peter went with these men, with, the, with these three men, and he brought with him six other Jewish brothers. The next day they arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was eagerly expecting them and called together all his friends and relatives, and there were so many people packed in his house. We gotta know something about this, this group of people that is uh, waiting, this congregation that is waiting for Peter. They were a group that was so eager to hear, to listen to what Peter has to say. They were so eager to hear the word of God. You know, that's the dream of every preacher, every pastor. The congregation eager to listen, to believe, and to obey. What about you today? Are you eager to hear the word of God? And Peter said this to Cornelius and his family and friends in verse 28. In verse 28, And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for, an, for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. God has showed me that I should not call any person common or unclean. This is the main lesson that God is teaching Peter right now. That Peter should not call any person common or unclean, or inferior, or less worth, or less dignity. That he should not be looking down on them. 
God was changing Peter's heart towards those that were different from him, towards the non-Jews. Dear brothers and sisters, do you consider a certain ethnic group, a certain nationality, to be unclean or uncommon? Do you look down on a certain group of people? Do you see your own culture as superior to others? And that's how the Jewish people felt about themselves. That's how the Pharisees felt about themselves. But Peter said, this is what he's beginning to understand, to realize in verse 34. Verse 34, I now realize, I now understand how true it is that God does not show favoritism. He does not show partiality, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. God does not show favoritism. Please turn to your family and say to them, God does not show favoritism. Peter is beginning to realize that God shows no partiality. Dear brothers and sisters, the Jews had this idea that they were clean. The Gentiles were unclean. But what they did not realize is that all people, including the Jews, have become unclean themselves. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The truth is this, all human beings have the same Creator. And all need the same Savior. All human beings have the same Creator. And all need the same Savior. What Peter was saying at that very moment when he says, God shows no favoritism, it's sweeping away centuries of racial prejudice between Jews and Gentiles. He and his Jewish friends were discovering that God's gift, offer of salvation, is not just for his own people but for all people who believe. Peter came to appreciate the racial challenge of the gospel. He realized that the gospel is not just for the Jews, but the gospel is for all people. God so loved the world. All are invited into the kingdom of God if they're willing to receive Christ. Pastor Tim Keller says it this way, the gospel is an exclusive truth, but it's most inclusive. It's the most inclusive, exclusive truth in the world. The gospel is an exclusive truth, but it's the most inclusive, exclusive truth in the world. Why? Because the gospel has an exclusive claim, truth. That Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way that we can get to the Father, no other way of salvation. But it is inclusive because the gift of the salvation is for all people from all nations through faith in Christ. There are some who believe some people are beyond redemption. Some people are beyond love. But what God is saying that there's no one who's beyond hope. There's no one who's beyond forgiveness. Peter said in Acts chapter 10, verse 43, To him, to Jesus Christ, all the prophets bear witness that everyone, everyone, who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name through his name even the people of Nineveh even the Roman centurions even the Assyrians even the Persians even the Romans even the Babylonians the offer of forgiveness is for everyone Gentiles too and you know while Peter was still telling them about Jesus life death resurrection the gospel the Holy Spirit fell on all the people in that household of Cornelius the Holy Spirit is coming again, just like he, he did in Pentecost. The Jews who came with Peter were amazed. It was like Pentecost all over again. But now it was not happening in Jerusalem, in Judea. It was happening in the Gentile land of Caesarea. Why did the Holy Spirit come on the Gentiles? One reason is to show Peter and the Jews that came along with him that God accepts the Gentiles also in his family and welcomes them. The Gentiles believed in the one true God. They put their hope in Jesus. The Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and his family. And they spoke in tongues and praised God. And they were baptized in the name of Jesus. That's why we have one Lord, one faith, one, one baptism. One more important thing that Peter did. And after preaching to them and baptizing to them, do you know that Peter could have gone home immediately, gone back to Jerusalem, and went back to his home church. 
But interestingly, Peter did not do that. Instead, Peter remained with them, with, Sint with uh, Cornelius and his family, for some days in Caesarea. Now that's also an interesting fact, significant. At first, Peter did not want to associate with Gentiles. Now Peter was in their house. Now Peter was staying with them for a few days, fellowshipping with them, discipling his new brothers and sisters in Christ. And that means that he has to eat with them also in the same table. The first time ever the church had Gentiles in it. It's a, it's, a, it's a new dynamic. It's a new joy and a new challenge, to be honest. But, but, but God was transforming Peter's heart. And God was transforming the hearts of the early Christians to accept and love and have fellowship with his Gentile brothers and sisters in Christ. God made Peter see that Cornelius has not just become a son of God, a child of God, but he is now also a brother in Christ. And dear friends, dear brothers and sisters, when we think of people of other ethnic groups, does your heart quickly have feelings of prejudice? Or rather, we have love of Christ towards people. Do we want them to know Christ? The story of Peter, the story of Peter and Cornelius, this is not just the conversion of Cornelius. This was also this is also the story of the transformation of Peter's heart. It shows us, this story shows us that God does not just love our own people. God, but God is showing us his heart. God's great love for people of other nationalities also. Sometimes the problem with us Christians is that our heart is not as wide and as big as God's heart. That's the problem with Jonah. God wanted to save the Ninevites, the Assyrians. Jonah was angry. But here we see Peter, Peter's heart transformed. You know, as Christians, we are the people who should have the least racial prejudice. Because God loves others and wants the whole world, and He wants us, we are to love them. You know, why should we not have racial prejudice? I want today to give you five reasons, as Christians, why we should see people of other ethnic groups with equal dignity. You know, if there is you know, prejudice or discrimination in our hearts, let's uh, pay careful attention to these five reasons. The first is this, is that first, that all human beings are made in the image of God. All human beings are made in the image of God. All human beings, whatever nationality, whatever ethnic background, whatever color of their skin, all have equal dignity and value. We all have the same ancestors, Adam and Eve. We all came from Noah. All made in God's image. When the Apostle Paul was preaching in Mars Hill in Acts 17, he said in verse 26 that from one man, just one man, God made all the nations. It was this belief in the Bible that made the British MP and Christian reformer William Wilberforce to fight for the abolition of slavery. Did you know that Wilberforce sold badges that proclaimed, Am I not a man and a brother? Am I not a man and a brother? British author Phil Moore said this, in a matter of years, Charles Darwin tried to sweep away not only God off the table, but also the value of some people of different race with him. He explicitly described this in his book, The Descent of Man. On the other hand, Christian reformers, along with Wilberforce, with John Newton, with John and Charles Wesley, and others, had spent decades in the early 19th century teaching Britain to view non-European peoples as their equals before God. As Christians, why should we see the equal dignity of people of every ethnic group? Because all human beings are made in God's image. All have the same Creator. When you look at someone, dear, bread, dear friends, do you see that person is made in God's image? Do you love them? Second is this. Why should we see other people of other ethnic groups equally? Because God does not show favoritism, but His offer of salvation is available to everyone. 
His offer of salvation is available for everyone. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says this about God. He wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. We cannot say, oh, oh these people, you're not allowed. You know, you, you don't have access to the gospel. But God desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So why should we look at other people as equal? Because we're all made in the image of God. And secondly, because God desires to offer His gift of salvation through Jesus Christ to all people. And thirdly, the gospel, the good news, the message of Jesus Christ, the, mess the Christian message, does not just reconcile us to God. It's not just a vertical reconciliation. But by His death on the cross, He also makes us part of the body of Christ, both Jew and Gentile. When we believe in, when we believe in Christ, God does not just become our Father, but others from all nations who come to faith in Christ also become our brother and our sister. Our family is expanded, and that is great joy for us, isn't it? Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male or female, you are all one in Christ. In other words, you are all equal in Christ. No matter what your economic status, no matter the color of your skin, no matter what ethnic background, whether you're male or female, Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. There is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. God is forming one new race, one people for himself, for Christ. I know a certain ethnic Christian is not better than another Christian from another country. God does not show partiality. We are all equal in the in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says it this way, He himself, Christ himself is our peace, who has made us both one, both us both, the, both the Jews and Gentiles, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. He broke the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile and has made them into one new people. This is the mystery of the gospel of Christ. God is making a one new people for himself. And we don't just become, God doesn't just become our father, but Christians all over the world becomes our brother and sister. And fourthly, because scripture tells us we are called to love our brothers and sisters in Christ and also our neighbors and even our enemies. God calls us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, and even our neighbors, even those who are against us. Remember Dr. Robert Cousins says that, why is it in Antioch, not in Jerusalem, the believers there were first called Christians? Because the church was a very diverse group. It was composed of Jews and Gentiles. It was composed of slave and free peoples. It was com composed of people who were well off and people who were poor all in one church, and yet they strive to love one another. That's why they were first called Christians in Antioch. That's why Jesus said in John 13, verse 35, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you truly love, if you love one another. If you love one another. Let's show the world what true peace is all about in Christ. We can only find this true peace in Jesus Christ. Paul appealed to Philemon to see the runaway Onesimus no longer as a bondservant, no longer as a slave, but more than a bondservant, but as a beloved brother. Philemon 16. Philip Yancey once said, One modern Indian pastor told me, Most of what happened in the Christian churches in India, including even miracles, can be duplicated in Hindu and Muslim congregations. But in my area, only Christians strive, however ineptly, to mix men and women of different caste, races, and social groups. That's the real miracle. We're called to love one another, brothers and sisters in Christ, 
even our enemies. And number five, finally, we see other people of other ethnic groups equally. We are called to love them because heaven will be a multi-ethnic gathering of peoples. That's what heaven will be like. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10 says this, After this, I looked, and there before me, Apostle John says, was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They're all standing before the throne, before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, were holding palm branches in their hands, and they together cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. My dear brothers and sisters, as a summary, why should we not have racial prejudice? Why should we, of all people, be the ones to, to love others? To be the models of love, examples of love? First, because all human beings are made in the image of God. Therefore, all human beings have equal worth and dignity. Secondly, God's offer of salvation is available for all people. Thirdly, the gospel reconciles us to God, but also to one another. And fourthly, we are called to love others just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And fifthly, that's what heaven will be like. So just to end your brothers and sisters, Let's look into our hearts today. Do we have prejudice? Are we quick to have prejudice or bitterness or hatred or animosity towards others who are different from us? Or do we love them with the love of Christ? God taught Peter that God does not show favoritism. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. God transformed Peter's heart. What about you and me? May God also transform our hearts today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your presence. And Lord God, we pray that you would open our eyes and that we might understand your word faithfully and not let our culture or our uh, society around us, you know, affect the way we see people. But rather, we see people the way you see people, Father God. Lord, help us to see others the way you see them. To remind us the value and worth and dignity of every single human life. That each person is made in the image of God. And Lord God, we pray that we would be agents of peace, that we would be agents of sharing the gospel, that we would have a heart for those of every nation and even our own people. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness when we have prejudice towards others or even towards our own culture. And we pray that you would transform our hearts. We realize that we're not clean and others are unclean, but rather we realize because of our own sin that we have become unclean. And we all are created by God and we all need the same Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Lord, we pray. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, Jesus said, if you love one another. May we show the world what Christian love is all about. That the world might see the love of Christ and glorify him. Lord, we pray that you would transform our hearts today. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.